All righty. We're back again with another Story Dive episode. And, we, you know, we're chilling out on this train. Got some comfy seats. Got some, uh, some good vibes going on. How are you doing, Kai? Uh, hello. I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. Um, I can't help but notice you started off with a nice customer service already. Um, Alrighty. <laughs> Just wanted to point that Wait, out. Is already a customer service thing? <laughs> Once I want every person to listen to how many times they hear either like a McDonald's cashier or even like your bank teller or any kind of customer service representative of any kind. How many times they'll say already? Yeah. Uh, how many times they'll say it over the phone? They'll say it in any and every situation. I mean, always I, it's already. I've got to listen out for this. I don't think I've ever heard someone say already. Like me, I mean, like not more than like the normal person. I did. Cause I mean, I technically work in customer service and I don't say already. I'm, I'm kind of, I have like that professional phone where I'm like, well, I mean, I, I honestly, I'm not, I'm not super professional. I should probably be more professional, but. I'm always, you know, it's like the whole, like, how can I help you? Like, have a good day. You know, I feel like the basics. Yeah. All right. But well, I, yeah, listen out for it. And, and, all righty. And, yeah. <laughs> all righty. Um, dude, it, it, it reminds me, uh, I feel bad because I'm, I'm a, this is kind of a little tangent. I'm, I'm a nice guy, I feel like. And I was raised to say please and thank you like a, like a nice person would. And whenever I go to Chick-fil-A, I feel bad because they always give me my, my drink and stuff. Like I finish my order and I'm always just like, thanks so much. You know, cause I like, I genuinely, I've worked in the food industry. It's not easy. So I really appreciate these people, especially when they're like doing their best. And, but I, I feel bad cause at Chick-fil-A, whenever you say thank you, they have to go my pleasure. And I'm like, oh man. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Have you ever <laughs> been tempted to be like, yeah, it is? No, dude, that'd be so weird. Oh my gosh, bro. They probably can't. I know. I, intrusive thoughts have suggested <laughs> that I do that once or twice and uh, I have I, to actively stop myself. Dude, if I said all righty, would they go my pleasury or something? My pleasury? Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, yeah, that's anyway. Just, yeah, I so just, I'm doing good. Yeah, it's great. Um, that's great. Do you have a story of the week for us? Uh, any any fun oh, stories? <laughs> Not to throw this on you. Uh, you got you got anything in the tank? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. All right. Let's let's hear. Let's uh, uh, let's see where it's at at the end. Come back to me. I, oh I'll, man. Okay. I'll have yes. something. Okay. Um. I promise. I'll, I'll have something. Okay. I believe you. I believe you. Okay. So that means we're getting right into the topic today. This week, I want to talk about um the exciting topic and stories of plot twists. Um, because plot twists are a thing in stories that I feel like I feel like they happen a lot, but this topic got me thinking because, you know, I want to I want to explore the the depths of this topic, but I'm also like curious if every story even has a plot twist. Is it something that every story does have? Is it every, something every story needs? Um, so we're gonna get into that. But to start out, I kind of just want to talk about um what some of your favorite plot twists are. Like, what are some examples? And I, I do want to preface anyone listening. Uh, I'm just going to say spoilers right now um, because plot twists generally oh, yeah. Major are spoiler. Yeah. Plot twists are generally spoilers. Like I know we talk about a lot of uh, different shows and a lot of different uh, like stories on this podcast, but this is specifically going to be talking about like the most spoilery stuff. Um, so if you hear us talk about something that you have not consumed, uh, you might want to at least you might want to dip out or maybe skip ahead. Um, but anyways, with that said, I'll start us off. I think one of the coolest plot twists is uh, Flowey from Undertale. I know Undertale's kind of been, it's to some people, it's like beating a dead horse. Some people, it's uh, 
Like, I, I don't know where the community's at with it anymore. I feel like Undertale's getting to the point where it's becoming cool again uh, because it's been long enough. Like, you know, uh, there was a period where it was like the most popular thing on the internet and then it kind of like died down. I feel like it's working. I feel like we're coming back. But I remember when I first played Undertale, um, by the way, have you played it? Am I going to spoil something for you? Uh, okay. I haven't played it, but oh I don't gosh. necessarily have the intent. I, I, don't, I don't know if I should tell you then. Um, cause I, part of me is like, do you, is there a reason you don't want to play Undertale? I'm curious or like, haven't played it. I just don't have time. Okay. I mean, I feel like I've heard a decent portion of the story and okay. it's to a point with me where if I do want to know what the story is, I can just go look it up in a let's play it's and i do know that there's like a couple of different endings and i know it's not it's like a personal experience for every person right but i have so many personal experiences every day that i just no i don't know know how many more i can handle man it's just i i think undertale is a masterpiece um and i know i know that the game is in a lot of ways overrated and the internet was oversaturated with it so I understand that that's a that's a turn off for a lot of people and the community can be a little weird sometimes. Uh, I'm not calling anyone out specifically, but um, part of me is like, I feel like you should just play it at some point. Like, I don't know if I want to say this here, which this is interesting. I didn't, well, I, I didn't do okay. it. Okay, fine. Okay. Um, I could take it. So I, the one of the, it, it was one of the best plot twists for me, which I feel like there's a lot of cases of this in a lot of stories, but this was like one of the first times I really experienced it. So uh, in the beginning of the game, there's the flower, right? Flowey. He's um, kind of just, he's, how should you put it? He's, uh, he comes across as nice and friendly, but he's like super evil. So like in the beginning of the game, he kind of like coaxes you in and is like, like, I'm happy tutorial, man. Oh, come here. And then he like tries to kill you um, and you get saved by someone. Um, and so, but then you just kind of forget about it. And as you go through the game, Flyway keeps popping up, like he's watching you or whatever. And you get to the end of the neutral playthrough and he's the last boss. He is the, uh, he like comes in right at the end and kind of steals the kill. Um, and it's like super tragic cause he kills this guy that like you didn't want to kill. Cause the whole game you can choose to like, like, uh, kill people or you can choose to have mercy and let them live. Um, so you can either be a pacifist or you can like kill everybody. It's like your choice. That's kind of what makes Undertale interesting is there's so many different decisions, but the thing is uh flowey, like you, you choose to save this guy and then he comes in and kills him and takes all of his powers and he like becomes this monster. Right. But what's crazy is you do that playthrough and you're like, Oh, he's just a, he's just a regular guy. He's just a evil, typical sneaky villain jerk face. And then you find out that he has this whole backstory. If you, this is if you do the pacifist run, there's this huge plot twist where um, you find out that this flower is the he's the son of the past king and queen of the kingdom, and he has this tragic backstory where he died. And so, um, where he died when monsters die, I know this is a lot of information. When monsters die in Undertale, they turn into ashes, like almost like dust. And uh, where he died was in this patch of yellow flowers. And they did all of these experiments. Like the, uh, I think that the parents were like, the dad wanted to like resurrect the kid or something. So like he got the scientist lady who worked for the kingdom to do all these sketchy experiments, trying to inject stuff to resurrect things and resurrect people that had died. All right, you're, they- you're losing me on some of this lore. <laughs> But they injected some of the flowers that the guy died on and it turned into like, so the flower essentially is the, 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 the dead child. And it's this huge plot twist. Um, where at the, anyways, so I, I just, I, I do, I just went on a huge undertale tangent, but it's like something that you, you would never see coming. Um, and it ends in this like huge, mm. amazing, uh, like emotional, epic ending, where he kind of like gets closure to his character arc and everything. Um, but okay, okay. So I I've said enough. Uh, what are what are <laughs> what are some of your favorite plot twists, Kai? Do you? 
Um, I don't know if that one would uh, do you, of anything. Oh yeah, I've, you got my plot twist pieces flowing. Um, have you ever played Chibi Robo? Yes, I actually have. Um, okay, I don't think you I know, know when the like. I think I've beaten it. Um, but I, I got to the point where the big robot was introduced. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Is, is there Mega more? Robo, the vacuum. Is there like more? No, I story? don't know. Okay. I'm just. No, no. The, the twist that I'm referring to is when, uh, as you mentioned, the flower, it made yes. me think of that weird pop rainbow flower dude that dies. Oh, wait. Does he have a name? I, I want to remember. He's him. like, it's like a jazz flower. And he he has a saxophone. Maybe he doesn't have a saxophone. What is his name? Oh. Funky Phil. Phillies. Funky Phil. I don't remember him. Is he from the? No wait. Second this one? is not it. No, no. He's in the original one. He's. He's a flower, or he's a plant, or he's, I don't know, and he wilts and he dies, and it was a twist, because I was not expecting it. Yeah. And it kind of killed my so, heartstrings a little. Right, right, right. So I guess this this kind of leads us into the question I had of, like, what determines if something is a plot twist? Um, Because, like, for, for the flowy thing, it's like, this was a character who was a, uh, he was a different character but we didn't know, right? It's like when the story finally unveiled that this guy was this other person, it like was like, whoa, you know? Um, but you were describing this flower guy dying and Chibi Robo kind of just as like an unexpected thing. Um, so yeah, what do you think? What do you think it like, what, what qualifies? Cause like, we could list some other things like it, does it just have to be unexpected for a plot twist to um, be, a, be a plot twist? It's like, oh, I didn't I didn't see that coming. I think there are different kinds. OK, there are different kinds of. Uh, twists, because there is the twist that's kind of almost done for. Um, oh, it is funky, Phil. Oh, and the Phillies are his kids. Yeah. I remember that. And so, you cry because he's kids. I don't remember him at all. <laughs> this is very weird to me. Maybe I thought I got far in the well, game. Well, that's I unfortunate. Didn't. Maybe I just don't remember. I just remember that guy and the eggs. The weird eggs that like guarded the living room that were so weird. Yeah, I remember all the army guys. <laughs> um, yeah, the eggs. Oh, that's Weren't what they you are, meant by the I eggs. I thought they were eggs. Maybe they are eggs, dude. I, this It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Oh, I do remember. Um, yeah, he's a plastic egg soldier. Dude, Space Hunter Drake Redcrest, bro. He's a he's sick. Um, but anyways, anyway, um, sorry. No, so the different, different types of uh, uh, twists. So I think there is a twist that's kind of done almost comedically. It, you have to. It's interesting because you have to build the right amount of tension around the twist uh for it to be effective otherwise it it, it's like two characters get hit by a car and everyone's like oh what right you know and it's almost like a funny thing it is it is technically a twist a plot twist but it's in that case it's more of a played for laughs so it's like a comedic twist I, I can't think of a... It's interesting. It goes back to that situation of like, well, someone just died. Why is that a funny... It's, well, maybe they did die. But regardless. Then there are the right. twists of like... I'm thinking Hans uh, like from Frozen is a common example. I do think that trope was played like a little too Wait, much. What's, his, it is, what's the plot I, twist with him? Remind me. This is Frozen 1. Oh, you mean, yeah, oh, so it's the guy in the beginning yeah. who is, like, trying to get with Anna, right? Bro, I was like, dude, what? It's, sorry, it's been a minute. It's like, been are a you minute. even an American? When you say, well, probably, dude, I'm not, I'm not the guy to talk to when it comes to current 
uh disney and stuff and i know it's not i know it's not like new but like i kind of lost touch with disney after uh i, I want to say tangled so it's been a minute since i've been like uh, okay. in touch with all those yeah, movies. Yeah. i have seen frozen though i have seen it but i saw it maybe five years after it came out um so anyways yes i know what you mean where it's like like it was the same trope in like incredibles 2 where it's like oh i'm i'm your friend we're buddies. Oh, I'm the villain now. Haha. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Um, yeah, that, that one is a little, there are overdone. countless video essays on that. subject. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that one's called. Um, I did want to read, cause I do have the definition here and there's a part of it that is very interesting to me. So it says here, a plot twist is a sudden and unexpected change in the direction or outcome of the story. Right. So we, we kind of already established that where it's like anything unexpected kind of seems like a plot twist. But it says here at the end, uh, it's a unexpected change of direction, uh, in direction or outcome of a story that surprises and challenges the reader. I I think that that's the part that interests me the most is that it not only is it unexpected, not only is it surprising, but it, it's it's challenges the the person consuming the story. It's supposed to challenge maybe your views on it, or maybe your like your establishment of these characters or what is interesting capable. I, I feel like that part of it, I feel like is very interesting to me. Um, Cause again, with uh, it's almost like when I think about that flowey plot twist, it makes me think about like, Oh, I didn't know this was possible, but, but now it is now I know it's possible. Like it's, it's expanding the rules or it's expanding what the, what the story is capable of, you know, in a way. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, um, I think a lot of modern stories, most specifically, go with the plot twist of no one is safe. Um, right. Where Attack on Titan is a very big, I think it might yes. be the number one, like, idea or creator of not. I don't want to say creator of this idea, but they definitely kind of took that and embraced it very yes. much. Well, where I, I would say for anime, you know, at probably. first, so many characters died. So many characters died at the first few episodes, just left and right. I mean, they lose what was for them was 20% of their population. And then by episode six, Aaron is dead. And it's like, wait, but he was the main <laughs> yeah. character. So yeah. now what? Yeah, there, yeah, and it really, it really brought about that. Oh man, no one is safe. No one has plot armor. But we've discussed before that then they had like so much freaking plot armor out of their butt. It was right. Insane, it's, so. It was almost like a reverse plot twist where it's like, oh, it turns out that like these characters just like can't die essentially, um, even if they, because you know, like they totally phrase it like Aaron died, but he's like back in the next episode and there's like a few more spots in the show where it's like, Oh, this guy's dead that he's not. Um, I think my first experience with that trope was probably walking dead. Um, cause in walking dead. It's very much like that where it's like anybody could die at any time. Um, and then of course there's like the two or three characters that you're like, well, they can't die, which I want to, cause I'm not, I'm not gonna, have you seen Gurren Lagann? Um, yes. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about? That, that show, huge spoilers for that show. Um, that show is like the, I think one of the best examples of like catching you off guard with nobody's safe, you know? Um, mm. even up until the very end of the show, like people are dropping, but you know, of course, Kamina, the guy who is the main character for the first you know, six episodes or so, uh, he's, he dies and he's completely taken out of the opening to the anime and like, he's, he's completely out. And, uh, I think that that example is a very much an example of that, uh, definition where I felt like that story very much challenged me. That plot twist very, it challenges a lot. Like I've watched that show with a lot of friends and a lot of them, when they get to the episode where he dies are like, I don't want to watch this anymore. And it's not because the show's bad. It's not because like, like the show 
did like like it, it's because they cared so much about that character that it, it I feel like it, it it's really hard to want to continue. But it you know that, that show's so good. I honestly I really love that show. Um, uh, uh, I've learned a lot. People from try it. I mean, at some point you'll get to know what throwing universes at each other is like. So look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean that it's it's a good payoff at the end. But I really do think that that show does challenge uh like the people who are consuming it in terms of like i don't know dude it, it, not not too many shows are able to really delve that deeply into like what it's like to lose somebody or kind of like changing the shift on who the main character is or you know all that stuff i feel like it's a very very good example of that and i, I it reminded me of uh game of thrones as i was saying this because game of thrones is also known for doing a similar thing in the first season um one of their main characters so it's yeah it's very interesting so i here to move forward with this topic i i did i there were three different examples that i have named here um for plot twists and we can kind of go through these real quick um the first one i have is kind of like what you would expect i named it it was right under our noses the whole time um, mm. so this one is kind of like, like, I, 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 how about this? I'll, I'll have you, I'll tell you the name. I want you to tell me what, like, give me your definition of, of these names of plot twists. Um, so the one you're talking about is that classic Scooby-Doo end where they pull off the mask and they're like, <laughs> yeah. Simon Cowell, <laughs> right. it was, it was him the whole time trying to rig the the arcade to shoot lasers out of its <laughs> yeah. bowling alley and he just wanted the money you know it's someone that like mm -hmm. was present the whole time or something that was present the whole time it just wasn't made apparent to the audience until the moment was right okay so like would you say foreshadowing has a role to play in this kind of uh yeah it can I have to admit, there are some Scooby-Doo episodes in my memory where I, they pull the mask <laughs> off and they're like, old man Frank. And I'm like, who the freak is old man Frank? I've, <laughs> yeah. where you get... And you go back and you watch it and he like walks behind the mystery van in like two frames of one scene. You maybe sort of are able to tell that it's him. Anyway, yeah, this, uh... you can stretch it a little far. Right. So I would say it typically should have foreshadowing. I feel like in the generic sense for this one. Um, okay. Next one, uh, straight out of left field is what I, this, this is the second one I named. So, Oh, this is when like your characters are having a, it's like a romance, right? When they're just about to do like get the get the smooches, get some action, and then a car <laughs> crashes into the restaurant and it's like oh. totally changes the shift and the pacing. Okay. So okay, I think that that's totally right where it's again, it is straight out of left field, right? It's like something crazy happens that like completely changes the story. Um, okay. And the next one is, I think it's one of my favorite kind of the plot twists. Uh, it's uh, only a drop in the bucket. Oh, this is the Legend of Zelda when you're like exploring the Great Plateau. And right, you're yeah. kind of getting a glimpse of everything. And then, then you get to like the hilltop and it's like, okay, now really explore the world. And right. you, you like stand on the cliff and you're like, oh my gosh, I was playing maybe like the Great Plateau felt so big. It felt like its own like Legend of Zelda game all self-contained. And then and you get to that thing and it, that moment was very much like, man, there's still 90% of this map to explore. I hadn't even started. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's exactly, I, I was actually going to use the example of uh, A Link to the Past where the game has three dungeons and you get to the, the you beat the three dungeons and you go back to Hyrule Castle and you fight Aghanim and you beat him and then he warps away with Zelda and you're like where did he go and you then get 
transported to the dark world. And it's like, oh, I thought I was about to beat the game, but it turns out there's, you know, nine more dungeons <laughs> to do and a whole other world uh -huh. map to explore. Um, that is one of my favorite kind of plot twists, especially in video games, when you just have that scope just zoomed out. You know, I can I know that there's more examples of this, but uh uh like maybe maybe spore or like other games like just just the feeling of like oh what i was doing is was so small compared to like how much there is like uh I love that insomniac feeling. spider man did this really well really um in what, in have what you part? played in the insomniac spider man yeah i've played spider man for ps4 and miles i haven't played spider man 2 um oh. so uh so the ps4 one you spend a lot of the time, like a good portion of time, it feels like uh, you're traveling the city, you're trying to learn the city, you're doing subquests, whatever. You're chasing off Sinister Six members. How did they get out? What's happening? Yeah. Something's going on. And then once you learn, it's Doc Ock kind of for the first time, and you do fight the Sinister Six on the raft. Yeah. and you you lose right but you're saved by the helicopter and you're just kind of dropped on a building not really dropped i guess you're like lifted to a i don't know spider <laughs> i can't remember fully right, right. but spider-man walks out and for the first time you see the city entirely on fire right and it's like mm -hmm. this is when act two starts the entire thing was all just leading up to act two so, okay and then act two in itself is like its own really long game Right. Uh, so what what you're saying, game. what you're saying is that it's not that they were withholding like the amount of the city you could explore, but it's like just that feeling of like, oh, like this is what the game's like, and like this is what they were leading up to this whole time, like to just having that yeah. that payoff and all the setup finally culminate, um, into like this big, awesome story. Because I'm with you. Like the second half of Spider Man is like. It, it it really grips you if you if you're into the story up to that point because the first half is kind of like okay well now we're focusing on this guy like you know you the game starts with kingpin you're like okay and then kingpin's not really involved and oh mr negative oh but i you know he's kind of interesting and the whole time you're like visiting octavius in the meantime but then it all just starts culminating and uh so i know it, it's weird in a plot sense i feel like it does that um because the whole city is kind of open from the start um mm -hmm. so yeah i feel like that is a good uh contrast um so real quick i did want to i i wanted to maybe go through some more plot twists and see where they fall on these because uh, do you think there are more versions of plot twists or do you think that those three i mentioned are kind of like define all of them like do you think they all categorize into one of those three um, or are there more I didn't mention? Uh, I cannot think of any that on the top of my head that aren't like just kind of exactly what you've previously right. described. Or it could, it could be a mixture too, obviously, like a Venn diagram kind of a thing. Um, so how, how about yeah. this? Um, Syndrome from The Incredibles. Where do you think he, that would fall? You think that would be... Uh, it was so and so all along. Or actually, that's a good question. Or is it straight out of left field? Because I, I think I think it's I think it's kind of it's right over our noses the whole time. But maybe both. Maybe that and the left field one. Maybe it's both. Because there was foreshadowing involved. You know, like they built it up. Yeah, that is true. I think it's a bit more of a. It was him all along, and then it has some left field in it, but it's not entirely because it is so foreshadowed. I think that it falls more under to that first category. A left field category to me is a bit more of a rare case, simply because you do have to pull something pretty much entirely unprovoked in any way to happen. Right, and it needs to work. Right, it can't be. Because here's something that's interesting is in Dragon Ball Z, because uh, there's Dragon Ball and then there's Dragon Ball Z. In, in Japan, it's all just one thing. It's all just called Dragon Ball. But Dragon Ball Z 
is Goku's adult life. And it's funny because they there's like what 150 episodes worth of Dragon Ball before Dragon Ball Z, and it's Goku's a kid, and he grows up. And then in the first episode of Dragon Ball Z, they're like, oh, Goku was an alien from another planet. And it's like, huh? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Oh, that makes sense. That's, but it's, it's weird because that plot twist, even though it feels like it came out of nowhere, it actually like makes a lot of things make sense because I, I don't think that the guy who made it, Toriyama, um, rest in peace, um, he, when he wrote, Dragon Ball and he got to that point I think he kind of just like shoehorned that in I don't think like I think he like was like oh this could work and kind of like made that I don't think he had that plan the whole time I don't think there was foreshadowing before that moment that he was an alien I don't know maybe I'm wrong um which would be fine but I uh, from my knowledge it's almost like it comes out of left field but it also answers a lot of questions that people had about Goku and his character um so I just feel like that's really interesting. Um, cause that is interesting. How can you introduce that? I kind of feel like that's that a, in, you know, it's almost a zoom out one, like a right. The third category you mentioned. It's kind of all three in a way. <laughs> Cause it's like, they built up that he was different, but they never explained why. And it kind of comes out of nowhere seemingly. And also expands the entire horizon um, what is possible in that world? Um, so maybe that's a, maybe that's the the ultimate example of all three. Um, but okay, so Kai, um, we have now reached the around the thirty minute mark of our podcast, and you know what that means? That means it's plot twist time oh. for the podcast. Oh shoot! I am now plot oh, twisting okay. the podcast and. I'm now turning the host privileges over to you. What and the? You're going, you're, it's, I, I'm giving you your topic here. Um, oh, okay. Just, <laughs> it's like, all right. oh, great. So as the, for the plot I know, twist. I can do this. I got this. <laughs> we've now entered the plot twist part of this episode where uh, now Kai is the host and his topic is country music. Um, so yeah, Kai, uh, what you, what you got, man? You, uh, <laughs> country music. <laughs> Sorry, bro. I I spun a wheel and it, it landed on country music. So country um, music. <laughs> okay, uh, dude. What do you have to say I about country music? <laughs> hate country music. I don't hate it, but I don't have a very big taste for it. Hey, I'll be the first to say I I don't like it. I I <laughs> I actually really don't like country music. I do know. I, I, okay, so I will tell this quick story. Uh, me and my wife and my brother will go to the Stadium of Fire every year. Um, if you're not familiar with the Stadium of Fire, it's the I think it's considered the nation's best firework show, or maybe really? it's just the state of Utah's. I can't it's, remember. It's definitely There's Utah's one of, best firework show, and, and I, I've been so yeah. Once, well, just so that you know, I, I've I've actually been once. To, so I know what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Well, so uh, for the people, the listeners who, who don't know, who aren't into the, the freedom firing yet, let me paint this awesome picture for you. You're in a football stadium that has been essentially renovated simply for the only act of shooting insane fireworks and flamethrowers up into the air and celebrating the 4th of July and Merca. And that's it. Like that's that's like the only reason that anyone is there. It's a big July the Fourth celebration. Right. There's usually a jet flyover, which is it, it fills me with such testosterone right. and manliness. Yeah, like when I went, they like guys parachuted in from planes to like yep. deliver the flag, the American flag. It was like so oh, snap. Yep. <laughs> like I, we're doing doing this. that. I went. I think one time for one of the shows, it was Nitro Circus, which is a, they're like a daredevil, uh, motorcycle daredevil team and stuff like that. And that, that was intense to watch. I, you want plot twists. Uh, I feel like those guys could 
plot twist right into hurting themselves really badly <laughs> with those stunts. Oh, man. It's almost like the way you're saying it means it wouldn't be a plot twist because people would see it coming. Uh, we would hope we wouldn't. See, I don't know. It's like, like maybe a, the plot twist is that, know, they, it was that they this don't care. all along. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you, I mean, you jumped out anyway, of a plane and like, you didn't die? We're totally... Well, but, yeah, well, we would hope. Right. Um, Going back to the so Stadium of Fire. Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting to it. It's, okay, it's okay. getting... <laughs> the wheels are spinning. <laughs> I had to take you around the whole bend sure. before we got to this. So that one of the times we went, there was a country singer. Can't remember the name of him for the life of me. He did make that song, The Big Red Truck or whatever. So it's like a famous country song. Okay, yeah. Truck. Sounds like a country it's, song. It's like a... I mean, I know a lot of country songs have trucks on it and stuff, but he, this one is like a very specific something about a big red truck. Anyway, dude, people were like bawling and sobbing around me. I, I couldn't necessarily identify with the music, but like my entire family is just sitting there, or at least my extended family are like singing and they're like waving their phone back and forth and there are some people like to the front of a couple rows in front of me and a couple rows in back of me. I could hear them both just openly weeping, uncontrollably sobbing. Um, so clearly there is a target market that deeply loves country music. Yeah, I, I just don't understand it. I, yeah, I, it's, I'm it's in the stupid. same position. And I've always wondered this because I'm like, is it because I was raised on video game music and chiptune? Is it because my dad loved rock and roll and prog rock? Is it because, like, I don't know why I don't like country music. I just, it just doesn't gel with me. I've, like, analyzed it because I'm a very bass and drum heavy guy. So, Country music doesn't really deliver on those parts for me. I really, I like funky stuff, I like a lot of funky stuff. And I like a lot of synthetic, like synths and techno sounds and country is kind of just like the antithesis of that, where it's very, ding, 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 you know, like very like simple guitar with like a decent drum beat and some guy with a low voice talking about, you know, something he likes or this girl and the beer in my hand, got the chicken on the road or whatever it is. I don't know. But it's like a lot of country Chicken songs on the road. <laughs> sound similar. I know, and I know it's not all of them, right? I've heard songs that classify as country that I do enjoy, but I, feel I really like want to hear someone uh, <laughs> make a song called "Chicken on the Road" and <laughs> write it, and compose it, there. perform it. It's, I'm looking it up. I'm looking let's it up. It. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Um, chicken. Oh, so Chicken Fried came up. Everyone's heard Chicken Fried. And that, that song's pretty all right. Not like my favorite. Um, but like, I, again, I'm not dissing anybody who likes country music. I think me and Kai both very much respectfully, like, we, we can nod to the country music community and say, like, you guys are cool. We just don't get it. We just, we don't get it. Um, <laughs> you guys are cool. I, Stay in your lane. I was just kidding. That's <laughs> I would love to like country music. I just don't. <laughs> Whenever it's on, I'm like, I, uh, you know, I, I would rather listen to anything else, really. Um, which is, it's just, it, I, I don't like that. I don't like it, but it is very easy for me to just like jump on that hate wagon of like screw country music. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, Kai. Um, your next topic is this another here. plot twist. Yeah, no, How did I see this one coming? Another topic oh coming no! In. Oh, so close, Thank bro. Goodness. So, so close to one that I know you would like. Oh, okay, favorite foods. Um, all right, what are your favorite foods, Kai? Favorite foods. Okay, this is an interesting question. It brings me to something that's just interesting about myself. I forget to eat frequently. <laughs> like my body just does not. Do you, do, you not, do you not get my wife hates this or... about me like <laughs> i so for some context in hawaii um especially as a missionary it was a very courteous the culture is you just accept when people give you something because it's the spirit of aloha that's like the whole right. point of the island yeah. the culture so the things that people give each other most often is food 
And especially if you're a missionary, a lot of people like to give you food. Right. So it was very often that I would eat four, maybe five full meals a day and also be wow. walking it off in that same vein. Wow. I'm pretty sure I had on Thanksgiving, I had four dinners, specifically wow. dinners. Wow. Um, how? Did, how? On like... top of. <laughs> How can well, because you... you're walking down the street and the this amazing Tongan family sees you on the street and they're like, hey, it's the mysteries. In their words, they say, elders, go get a plate. And they hand you a giant plate of food. Oh, man. And if you say no, it's really disrespectful and offensive. So you take it. You talk with them for a bit. and They're like, how come you're not eating? Okay, oh, I guess yeah. I'll eat some. Even yeah. though I've had four. I mean, I'm, anyway, from, so... I'm from the South and it's very similar down there where it's like, you, you either eat what's on your plate or you maybe sometimes you ask for help, but like you, you like food is very much like a love language down there. Um, people make food and you, and you eat. I mean, I'm sure it's like a universal thing around the world, but I, it's a very similar vibe from where I, I was raised where it's like, you know, uh, if someone makes you a meal, you, 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 you eat it, you know, um, that's that like you eating it yeah. shows them how much you appreciate it and how much you, you liked it or how grateful you are. You know, it's like, exactly. Like that, that's what, if you well, have a clean so, plate, then they did a good job as a cook, you know? So, yeah. And it's, it's all well and good, except for the Tongans have a saying called Kaike Mate, which means eat until you die. That's what it translates oh, into. Man. So <laughs> Dude, I, some days I feel <laughs> that man. Some days I'm like, today's the day, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm yeah. eating one more piece of cake and it's, it's, and then I'm ascending. Um, so. Right. Well, so <laughs> you do that for two years straight. Oh uh, boy. It really did something to my metabolism where my body just doesn't really give me the normal hunger. cue. I've actually had to be working on it. it. I didn't even realize it was necessarily a problem until uh, I met my wife and she asked me what I'd eaten that day. And I was like, uh, I had two chips dipped in salsa. What? And she's like, okay, well, what did you do today? And I was like, uh, I worked chips? a full shift at my restaurant. And Why at chips? that shift, I served like over 20 tables. And I had accumulated 40,000 steps in that day, one day. 40,000? And she was kind of like, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, it was honestly what? one of my most active, at least recordable days. Wow. I mean, I, I think I had a uh, Pokemon go or something. I, I, I can't remember, but I was at like Disneyland with my family and I was getting like maybe 15,000 steps a day, maybe 20,000 on like a full day at an amusement park. Um, so that's, that's impressive, bro. 40,000 and only two chips. Yeah. To be fair though, I had really bad vertigo afterward. And oh, I did not feel good for several days. So wow. it's not healthy. And I recognize it's not healthy. But that does bring me to my favorite foods. Oh, that yes. Sometimes it's tough because it's like I have categories where I have some of my favorite foods are um, like what I just like to make every other day. And then there's like exotic favorite foods, like restaurants to eat at and specific meals you can get at those restaurants. Yeah. But as far as like a, a genuine favorite food, I'm not sure I have one. I just have ones that's like, if my price range is I'm eating at home and I have no time because I'm like building a board game and running a podcast and all that stuff, then there's a category for that. And then there's a category for like, if I have money to splurge, I could eat wherever I want right now. I'm going here. Right. Um. So what? So, <laughs> but let's just like uh, just, just name a few. Just name a few of your favorite foods. Um, okay. It, it could be on the category of. Okay. Um. On the category of here at home, dude, mac and cheese. I have lived off of mac and cheese since I was a toddler. Are you talking? Like there's craft? something about. Are you talking like? Craft I am talking about craft. This. Um, the most basic blue box craft mac and cheese with a couple of hot dogs in there. Dude, for some reason, that fills my soul. It's like the only sustenance I need. 
looking at the <laughs> sometimes. Dude, it's good. And you can like, you know, put all sorts of stuff in it to like spice it up. Like I think my friend uh, taught me like you can put like chopped up hot dogs in it or you can put like real cheese in That's there. That's exactly what I what you that, can, yeah. Right. Like so uh, you, could, you could do so many different things to it too. Um, it, I think basic foods are very good for, you know, being creative and i mean you don't even have to do that either you could literally make it in the microwave and cause that's the whole point of having crap mac and cheese is it's low maintenance it gets the job done doesn't cost a lot and it has that nostalgia factor if you grew up with it so that's a good one yeah so one of the other favorite dishes i can think of is i like to make rice and spam yes but the way i make spam is not i mean i know some people are just like bagging themselves as i mention the word spam sure sure spam is is but, definitely you either love it or you hate it it's definitely one of those foods yeah well i just have learned i've experimented with different kinds of sauces how to uh like drench it in certain sauces how to make sure it's it tastes really good the right seasonings on top the exact runtime of how to do it i put it on some rice and make it to work and that's a good it's a good hearty meal. I honestly sometimes feel like, you know, when Link is cooking in in Legend of Zelda, yeah, and that like music goes off, and then afterward your food bounces out of the pot, and it's like magic. Yeah, like and it's like the, you hear the gong. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's the feeling of when I when I <laughs> put that spam on the rice. I'm like, dude, I I did it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that, man. And I think that that's a great, that's a great meal as well. I mean, it shows like, you know, I, I, did you, did you learn how to do that while you were in Hawaii or was that something you learned when you got back? Um, it's actually something I more perfected when I got back. I didn't, I didn't really learn how to cook much in Hawaii simply because I never cooked. It's, I, there right. was never a need it just it, when you say spam I, I think of hawaii because that's that's the culture that i think prefers spam the most I, I know that like anybody can eat it but um it just i was interested if like you learned it in hawaii because they love spam over there um so i should have to picked up more tips and tricks but i don't know it never came up interesting. what about okay. you favorite favorite uh oh favorite foods, favorite foods. uh pfft. Let's see. For a long time in my life, pasta was my favorite food. I would just say pasta. Um, I think at this point currently, um, I'm a huge fan because, you know, I go to Mobetas a lot, which is funny because we're talking about spam. We're talking about Hawaii. Um, I've become a huge fan of pulled pork and rice and just uh, like chicken has been a huge thing for me. Oh, uh, so I, but I would say you've unlocked. <laughs> A memory. Okay, okay. Well, a you, favorite food. Here, I, I want you to say your memory, and then I'll, I'll finish off with my favorites. Um, okay. In Hawaii, there is a place called Wailua Bakery. Mm, wait. In that wait, wait, bakery, wait, wait, wait. is this the bakery where the kids drove their dad's car? No, no, that's Liliha Bakery. Okay, <laughs> that's a different one. <laughs> okay, they're on they're on entirely separate. Uh, sections of the island. Okay. Same I island. Just uh, same island, different bakery. Really... Uh, got it. Yeah, different bakery. <laughs> okay. It is a bakery. They do sell like lots of nice breads and stuff like that, but they also sell sandwiches, but mm. like Hawaiian sandwiches. And the family that owns that place, I would help them do construction sometimes uh, to help them build like their house. They, they just yes. would have us do service right. with them. Yes. At one point I chainsawed down like an 80 foot tall pine tree. I didn't chainsaw it down, but it definitely almost fell on me. That was oh, a story for another time. <laughs> wait, wait. Well, it's, it was tough work. It's construction. It's tough work. At the end of it, they would reward us with a, you can get whatever you want at Wailua bakery. So we would go and I'd always get a clue of pork, uh sandwich. Ooh. And inside it would have clue of pork, bacon, tomato, some lettuce and a lot of Brussels sprouts, which Ooh. I'm not a what? huge fan of Brussels sprouts. For some reason, when I got a hold of that sandwich, I would take a bite and I would just like part of my soul would 
like <laughs> move away into the heavens. Oh man. And I would be whisked away. That sandwich, I think of it so often. I when in the it's been what? Eight, yeah, about eight years since I've had that sandwich. So almost a decade since I've actually eaten that sandwich. I think about it frequently and I salivate profusely when I think about <laughs> that sandwich. Wow. Uh, dude, you're making me want to try it like really bad. Um, cause okay. Yeah. So yeah, those, those are all great foods, great options. Cause you're right. There is different levels of it where it's like, I have my easy go-tos. Uh, I feel like I should say one, like when I'm home, it's like, I usually go for grilled cheese or a cheese quesadilla or, you know, um, if I'm feeling a bit more like maybe I'll make some rice and put something with it. Cause I think I would say my, my number one favorite food, not number one, one of them is just generally rice with any kind of meat that is decent. I will like it. So again, you got Mobetas, which is, you know, Hawaiian, you got the pork, you got the chicken, you got the rice. I love any kind of Asian food. Typically I'm a big fan of most Asian foods I've had, um, like sushi, Japanese stuff. I'm a huge fan of that side of the, like Indian food. I would count as like Thai food. That whole realm of of uh, food culture, I just love most of the stuff that they have. At least in America, I know that it's not the same uh, if you were to go to the actual country. But other than that, I do like Italian, particularly pasta. Um, my favorite, because this is a, you know you were telling a story about your your uh, that amazing sandwich. I had an experience here uh, at this Italian restaurant called Carabas. I don't know if anyone's been to Carabas. It's a restaurant we used to go to growing up, with my grandma. And there was one out here in Utah, and we would go there with my grandma uh, for a couple years. This was like, I don't know, back in the 2010s uh, to like 2015-ish time. And we would go, and they had this goat cheese, mac and cheese cavatappi. And it was the greatest mac and cheese I've ever had in my life. Uh, I know that goat cheese isn't for wow. everybody, but this mac and cheese was like otherworldly, dude. I it, like you were talking about with that sandwich, like this mac and cheese would like ascend me, bro. And <laughs> I got it like two or three times because we, we, we would go over the course of a couple of years. And once I discovered it, I ordered every time. And I got so sad because we came in one time and it wasn't on the menu anymore. And the waiter no, came over and they're like, yeah, we changed chefs. This is a different, we have a different chef. No. A different menu. And I've not been able to get that pasta ever again. It's gone into the ether. So that was a tragedy. That was you're one gonna of, tell me a tragedy. <laughs> I, so I can no longer get that meal, but you know, just some other off the top of my heads. I love Jersey Mike's, uh, Mike's way, please. I'm a huge fan. I love, you know, uh, I'm a huge fan of cookies and donuts. Those are probably my two favorite dessert kind of meals. I have a huge sweet tooth. Any kind of breakfast food, I will eat it up. I'm, I'm a, I like Waffle House. People hate on Waffle House because it's dirty or whatever. I love Waffle House because it, it's, it's Southern breakfast at its finest. Okay. And I just give me waffles, give me buttermilk pancakes, a bunch of eggs, hash browns, grits, sausage, bacon, toast, the whole deal. I love the, all of that is like cream of the crop for me. Okay. So, um, yeah, those are my favorites. So that's just a look into my, my palate. Give me gluten. Give me sugar. That's, that's me in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> that's, a, so. that's a healthy diet. <laughs> Dude, it works for me. Okay. It's been scientifically proven that I need gluten. All right. So we're still here. So yeah, you clearly you, it's good enough. When I'm sick and if I eat like a cinnamon roll with frosting on it, when I'm sick, it like gives me strength and energy, bro. Like that, that is what gets me going. Um, okay, Kai, last topic and we can make it quick. Let's see what you get. Oh yeah. Plot twist. I <laughs> forgot serious? that this is a plot twist episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, okay. So your last topic is Cyclops from Marvel. Um, Dude, how did you <laughs> land that one? I can't believe you landed that one. I'm th uh, okay. Um, I guess because uh, you know we do have to end here pretty soon, but uh, yeah, just give us your whatever whatever you would like to say about it. 
uh, now's the time. You have the floor. Okay. Cyclops <laughs> is childhood hero. Um, pretty much, I think he, he he's in the contender for like my favorite Marvel character to exist. Um, I love the crap out of Cyclops. He is so freaking cool, and the way the whole dichotomy of his character is interesting to me is so intriguing because it's it's a situation where he's he's his power is pretty much only a detriment and yet he somehow has to learn how to twist that into becoming something good right shooting lasers out of your eyes pretty much every time you open your eyes is really sucky and it it is harsh to he has to wear those those red sunglasses to block right. it mm-hmm. or he has his super dope visor which i think his character design is also really awesome no matter which character design <laughs> actually that's a lie there's one or two of them that i'm like oh, right no. right uh th- like at one point is like super edgy long hair which is funny because like i have long hair but i mean his it just doesn't look really good on him it's like mullet long anyway i'll show you a picture sometime but the point that I'm trying to get to is with his his uh that dichotomy it's just such an interesting character premise to be to have to take something that is such a detriment to you and turn it into one of your greatest strengths yeah yeah it kind of reminds me of like uh Mirio in a way from my hero and I know that like most of the x-men yeah in this category because we, we talked about how the x-men kind of all have that flaw that they need to like find out how to make it a strength. Um, but yeah, I, I think about Mirio a lot too, where it's like, oh, this power sucks and it's terrible. But like he ends up making it like one of the coolest, scariest powers. Um, yeah. So if it's, it's one of like the that, purest. So if it's anything like yeah, that, that's, I, that's what amazing. I'm, what I'm thinking is it's like the purest form of like character arc that you possibly get in that like his, the very essence of his character the fact that his character exists in on its own is a character arc that he has to uh go through this it's a very thing it's a very visual thing right where like i feel like with a lot of people it's like this weird internal struggle like i feel like i relate with like maybe the the hand i was dealt in life is just unfortunate or maybe I'm just unlikable or whatever. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's like how I feel currently, but like I've had those feelings and thoughts throughout my life of like, you know, uh, am I enough and all that stuff. And I know people struggle with that. And to have such a clear and visual indicator of that with his, the way his powers work, um, I think w- will help a lot of people to kind of maybe uh, relate and understand. Um, but, uh, you know, but it's got that like supernatural side of it that like, is super intriguing um you know uh-huh. so, yeah that's awesome um and uh, yeah i of course i knew you like cyclops so i put him on the wheel just in case um, i'm so glad <laughs> i was uh, made my entire so, day okay so that and the wailua bakery sandwich <laughs> so to, so to take the reins back and, and to be host again um ah, the plot sorry, twist, plot twist the again. betrayal I, I to to close this episode out, I, I wanted to end by asking if all stories need a plot twist. Um like is it something that completes a story? Is it something pe- stories need to be elevated? Um because I feel like most stories have that, right? Like they have that unexpectedness to it. They have that foreshadowing that leads up to the climax. They have all this all these things that lead up to a plot twist. And um also did it make this episode better <laughs> did the plot twist of this episode make it more interesting um <laughs> you know so uh, what, what do you think are you asking me if it made the episode more interesting yeah do you think do you think the plot twist made it more interesting do you think actually yes <laughs> not in the sense that i didn't i don't have fun with these because i actually really do no, yeah i have exactly. a lot of fun with these but somehow the plot twist suddenly did make me kind of engage and it did challenge my like, what do I think this episode <laughs> was going to be? And it's totally not what I thought it was. So we're right. going to have to go okay. See? with that. So it did. I think it it isn't. 
I do think it is a necessary piece of any good story or uh, an enticing ah, story. Okay. If your goal is to tell an enticing good story. It has to have a twist or two. Otherwise, okay. your the engagement level is not going to be as high. It's just a matter of why would you ever write a story without a plot twist when writing a story with a plot twist is always better. Okay. I cuz I agree, but I do I I'm like I'm sitting here and I'm like there has to be some stories out there that don't have plot twists that are interesting. But maybe I'm wrong. I you know cuz I, I mean even if you look at like the way YouTube and like media does like advertising or like the you know thumbnails and titles and uh it's you know there there's something to be said about people taking ideas and putting a twist on them, you know. Um that might feed into it too. It's like like you said, engagement. It just makes things interesting. Um, you don't want the the plot to get too, you know, uh, boring or dull or stale. Um, I mean, isn't the whole concept it? of like clickbait? It's kind of like putting the plot twist at the very beginning of the story. Right. Well, I mean, but that's what a hook is, right? I feel like uh, I don't think it's necessarily putting the plot twist at the beginning, but it's putting a Maybe it's putting a plot twist at the beginning. Because, like, the whole idea of, uh, like, let's say Mr. Beast comes out with a new video that's like, how, how many airplanes can fit in this giant hole before I blow it up or something? Like, in a way, that concept is a plot twist on what you normally see. Like, it's like, oh, this is a new idea. That is interesting. And I honestly am curious what the answer is, you know, because it's, it's trying to get you to click on the video in like, it's trying to describe what is in the video, but the video itself needs to be something that's new and interesting. So I guess in a way, in a way it's a plot twist, but I feel like a plot twist is typically they establish something. And then the plot twist is something that happens in the middle that kind of like shifts your, your perspective on it. And, of what your expectations were um if that makes sense and i guess there could be bad ones i like it i guess there could be bad like you know like there can be definitely bad plot twists yeah like something that For ruins sure. the story or takes away from it or even in the terms of the youtube stuff where it's like oh the thumbnail and the title say one thing and then the video itself doesn't reflect that like maybe that in, in, in a way is a plot twist where it's like it kind of more shifts. of a bait and switch, which I guess is a form of plot twist. Yeah, I guess that's what it's the just bad not a good one. Would be. Yeah. Um, is that the unspoken fourth black sheep category? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The what, what would you call it? the bait and twist? Um, the, the bait, the, and, the, bait and the twisty. The, the yeah. Che the cheese in the trap. The Tom and Jerry. No, Tom and Jerry's good. Um, I don't want to ruin Tom and Jerry like that. So. Anyways, uh, thanks for joining us on this episode of Story Dive, where we talk about plot twists. That's all I had for you guys today. Uh, and uh, I, I, for some reason, I just want to say alrighty. I just feel like it seems appropriate at the end here. <laughs> alrighty. <laughs> Welcome to the end of the podcast. But yeah, you got any last plot twists for us, Kai? Uh, you know, it would be a big plot twist for the audience. Is if they smack that subscribe button, bro, and or if they unsubscribe, they that'd be a plot twist. If we if we ask them to, that would be a plot. Twist. Don't like and don't subscribe, and don't don't tell your friends. How about that? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> this, yeah. Is this challenging? Is this a situation where we're like challenging? You will. You wouldn't do that. You, <laughs> you wouldn't, wouldn't dare to unsubscribe. <laughs> I mean, okay, maybe maybe they would. Anyways, we'll see you guys next time. Take yeah, care. take care. Alrighty. <laughs>